Our scripture passage today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 19 through 31. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. Are you the prophet? He answered. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor the Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. The word of the Lord Thanks be to God. Children are dismissed if they'd like to head out to Children's Church. Today, friends, we get to, to hear about and uh, talk about one of, one of my heroes in the faith. Uh, John the Baptist has always been one of those people I've thought, Lord, one day when I grow up, I want to be like him. And I do not mean a steady diet of locusts. That's disgusting. I don't know why he did it. Uh, or wearing scratchy, itchy clothing. Not my thing either. Um, the thing that I most love about John the Baptist, aside from the fact that he was, you know, Baptist. I'm just saying. You don't, there's no John the Presbyterian in the Bible, okay? <laughs> Just go throw it out there. The thing that I love the most about John the Baptist is that John knew why he did what he did. Like he knew what to, the, to his core. He knew why he was put there. He knew why he was called to do what he did. Now, if you read Matthew, you read Mark, you read Luke, they dedicate entire chapters to talking about the kind of biographical information. They give you all kinds of details about John. So Luke talks about uh, John's miraculous birth and his dad being made silenced for nine months of his wife's pregnancy, which must have just been loads of fun for everybody involved. All three gospel, synoptic gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they talk about the the following that John had. All these people, they use language, they say everybody from Jerusalem, everybody from the countryside, they came to see this man who was preaching and teaching, uh, you want to talk fire and brimstone, and who was baptizing people uh, into this promise, this new covenant that came because of Jesus Christ. But John, our gospel writer, he doesn't talk about any of that stuff. He doesn't give you any of the extra details. He doesn't really go into anything. All he wants us to know is why John the Baptist did what he did. And I think we need to know why he did what he did. Because we're going to discover that what John did, the, the broad picture of it, is what we're called to do as well. So let's talk about it for a second. What exactly was John doing? Or the short version is John was using his platform to prepare the way. Right? John baptized people, he preached out in the desert, he did all of these things. But when the Jewish leadership shows up and they come out to the desert and they say, John, why are you doing this? John's response is to tell them, you need to know what I'm doing. 
So when he asked, John says to them, verse 23, John replies in the words of Isaiah the prophet, All I am is the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now, when John quotes there, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, and the people who heard him that day would have known the wider quote, right? So if you turn to Isaiah 40 and you looked in verses 3 through 5, you'd read this. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be raised up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough ground will become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. All people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So when we go back to John, right? John's standing out here in the desert. He's amassing this following. People are coming from all over to hear what it is that he has to say to be baptized by this man. John says, I'm really only ultimately doing one thing. I'm using the platform that God's given me to prepare the way for the Lord to come. And when he quotes Isaiah 40, he's got a picture in his mind for what it means to prepare the way for the Lord to come into people's lives. Because that's the language Right, Isaiah 40 is not about making the way to get to God. It's about preparing the way for God to come to his people. So John stands in the middle of a desert, long before interstates and highways went in, right? And there's valleys and there's mountains and there's incredible rough terrain. And he says, my job is to smooth it so that God can come to people. My job is to use my platform and come to people and look at the valley in their life. Maybe it's a valley of despair or it's a valley of doubt. Maybe it's a, it's a valley of just, I got so many questions or the circumstances of their life. And he says, my job through my platform, and for him that was preaching and teaching and baptizing, is to take one shovel full at a time and fill in that valley so that there's a smooth path, a, a highway for God to come straight into that person's life. Or he says, I come before people and I see the mountain. I see the mountain of their sin or that idol that they just don't want to give up. I see the mountain that is this obstacle between them and the Lord. And my job, one shovel full at a time, is to take it down so that there's a highway. That's what John was doing. Now, he did it uh, with all kinds of fun stuff like eating locusts and wild and crazy clothes and preaching in a way that would get most pastors fired. But John said, this is what I do. Now, John was called, friends, to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ to come, to use his platform in a way that was unique just for John, okay? John was uniquely called to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ, the one who would go and proclaim the Messiah is coming and mean it. He's literally on his way right now. Jesus himself describes John and said that until Jesus' birth, John was the most blessed person there has ever been, okay? From Adam and Eve on, across all cultures, all times, Jesus says there's something unique about John. The way he prepared uh, for the Lord to come was unique to him. And yet, I'm pretty sure all of us, if we're in Christ, are meant to do what John did, to use our platform, whatever it might be, whether the platform is a pulpit or it's a classroom, whether it's a boardroom or a living room, to use wherever it is that God has put us to prepare the way in other people's lives for the Lord to come. That means my job as a Christian is to always be looking at the person in front of me and saying, I can see the valley. How can I, one shovel full at a time, love you live the gospel in front of you, speak the gospel in such a way that little by little we fill this valley in so that when Christ comes, you're ready to hear him. That's my job. But here's my little problem. I don't really want to do it. I grew up, friends, in a good old Baptist church where they legit believed we were Baptists because John the Baptist was. If you believe that, let's talk after, okay? Okay. That's, that's not a thing. That's not where the denomination started. But I grew up in a church where every single Sunday it was driven home that my job was to make disciples. This is what Jesus said my marching orders were. 
So every Sunday, the pastor would get in the pulpit, and he kind of looked like John the Baptist, and he preached like John the Baptist. And he would stand up there, and he would hammer, well, hi, he'd hammer home that my job was to go to my class that week and look for people who didn't know Jesus and tell them the gospel. And all I could think was, do you have any idea what that's going to do to my already not good social standing in my middle school and high school, oh, preacher man? And he would look back and he would say, but if you don't tell them, they're not going to know Jesus. And I'd be like, I'm really sorry for them, but I, I just, that's like hell on earth. Every time we turned around, it was, you, we, were, we were expected at the end of every Sunday that the sermon finished, you would come to the altar, you'd get on your knees, and if tears could be summoned, they should be. And I would pray on behalf of people that didn't know Jesus. That was what I was supposed to do. And I would get there on my knees and go, but why am I doing this? There are days today where I wonder. And here's the thing. I'm the pastor, so I'm pretty sure my platform <laughs> is about preparing the way for people to know more and more of who Jesus Christ is. But what about for Becky? I like picking on Becky from the pulpit. What about Becky in her second grade classroom? You know, is, is that her job? Is the platform that she's been given to prepare the way for her students and the aides who come into her classroom and the other teachers and colleagues that she works with, is it her responsibility to stand there, look at them and say, I can see the valley, I can see the mountain. How can, Lord, how can I be used of you to help prepare the way for this person to be ready to receive the gospel? My guess is her employer would say, that is not your job. <laughs> or when Dave, God bless him, is an accountant and he does math, horrible math, tax-related math, and he's working with his clients. Is that what he's responsible to do? The gospel of Jesus Christ would say yes, that every one of us, whatever our platform is, if you're sitting in your living room or you're in a courtroom, that whatever I've been given, every relationship I'm given, I am invited to use that as a way to say my job is what John the Baptist's job was, to prepare the way for Jesus Christ to come. But if I'm going to do the what, then we've got to know why. Because I'll be honest with you, me giving you 10 steps for how to do that, really irrelevant because we all have very different platforms. But us understanding why we are called to do it, why John the Baptist did it, he did it to the point that he got his head cut off, okay? He said, I am so committed to preparing the way that nothing and nobody will ever stop me. When you and I get the why, we won't struggle with figuring out the what. So why did John do it? You know, the, the Jewish leaders who came out from Jerusalem, they come to John, and they, they point blank ask him. They say, if you're not the Messiah, you're not the one we've been waiting for, and you're not Elijah, like reincarnated from the dead, then why? Why are you using your platform to prepare the way? It'd be kind of like them saying, if you're not the pastor, how come you're so concerned about this? John's answer is amazing. Because what John responds to them with, and he says this here in uh, verse 26, he says, I baptize with water, but among you stands somebody you don't know. He's the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Now to understand that why, we need to unpack a little bit about John's culture. You know, and You've all heard this, right? In John's day and age, in Jesus' day and age, uh, uh, Nike and Adidas did not exist yet. People didn't, if they had shoes, they were going to be open-toed sandals. And the ground, dusty, messy, dirty, a lot of dung, not a pretty thing. There literally were laws on the books in this time that said if you were a rabbi, so you were a teacher and you had disciples who followed you, or you were a Jewish person who could pay, you had servants who worked for you. You could not make your Jewish disciple or your Jewish servant have to untie your sandals and deal with your nasty little tootsies. It was too disgusting, too degrading. The only person you could make do that would be a Gentile servant, okay? So what I expect John the Baptist to say then is I expect him to say, you all don't know this, but the reason 
why I am preparing the way is because there is someone among you who is so above the highest of the high that in comparison to him, the only thing I'm worth doing is untying his sandals and cleaning up his tootsies. But what John says is, I'm not even worthy to have the lowest, most disgusting job. He is so above the highest of the high that I am so below the lowest of the low in comparison to him. I'm not even worthy to do the job of a slave. You catch that? That's John's beautiful poetic way of saying, I'm more wicked than you could begin to imagine. This is John the Baptist, guys. This is the same man that Jesus, go check out the book of Matthew, Jesus really does say there is no one as blessed as John the Baptist up until Jesus is coming. And John says, but this is who I am. I am not worthy to come anywhere near this man who you don't yet know. John says, I am below the lowest of the low. And for that reason, I have to to use my platform to prepare the way for this man to come. Now, we've talked about this idea before, right? It's the, it's the bad news of the gospel. <laughs> the bad news of the gospel is you and I are all more wicked than we dare to imagine. There are thoughts that we think that if they got broadcasted up here, we'd just never come back. There are things that we've done or said that we're utterly convinced have to stay a secret because all of us, even the best of us, are more wicked than we could ever begin to imagine. Now, nobody likes thinking that way. None of us. A couple weeks ago, I was on the phone with a, a friend of mine who's going through a rough patch, and she just kept saying over and over and over again, but Kelly, I'm a good person. I was like, okay. She said, I'm good. I go to church, I sing the songs, I pray the prayers, so this shouldn't be happening because I'm fundamentally, at my core, good. If we spoke back to her and said, no, actually, you're just like John, you're below the lowest of the low. In comparison with Jesus Christ, you're not even worth cleaning his sandals, much less expecting him to do anything for you. I think she'd have hit me. This summer, when I had the chance to preach at the the Women's Thrive Conference, a couple weeks after it, I got a note in the mail from a very sweet woman. I know her. She loves Jesus. She's been saved for 70 years. She's a pastor's wife. And the note said, thanks so much. I'm still trying to swallow the pill that I'm more wicked than I ever dare imagine. She's been a Christian for 70 years, and she's still over here going, I don't want to think that way. Well, neither do I. And yet it's true. And because John understood that, he could come up to any person and he could see their valley and there's no judgment. Because if he's below the lowest of the low, then whatever caused their valley, whatever is their mountain that is the obstacle between they and the Lord, it, their, their mountain might be different than his, but it's not worse. Period. That's why John can come with such incredible humility because he understood that. When you and I figure that out, then we start to look at people where we're at in the platforms that we've been given, wherever they may be, and we look at them and we say, we serve a Savior who they don't know, who's so above the highest of the high that compared to them, they are below the lowest of the low, and so am I. That means with humility I can come. I can help you fill in those valleys, dig out those mountains, because we're in the same boat. But guys, that's not the only reason, right? That's not the only why behind John and what he did. The next day, we're told, verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him. Can you just picture that for a minute? Right, John, who is, who is wrapping his brain around, I am below the lowest of the low. I, I, I'm not even worthy to come near Jesus and say, can I clean your feet? He looks up. And Jesus, the one who's above the highest of the high, is coming to him. Can you imagine what that feels like? It should take our breath away every time we think about it. Only most of the time I refuse to believe that I'm below the lowest of the low, and I think Jesus is so privileged to come to me. But John, who knew who he was, sees Jesus coming. 
And the only thing he can say, he looks at his disciples and he says to them, look, come see this man. This is the one I've been telling you about. And he calls Jesus by this beautiful name. He says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the entire world. Now, guys, scholars debate a bit about what uh, is John referencing. You know, what exactly does he mean when he says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? At the very least, he's got to mean the Passover Lamb. If y'all were here a couple years ago, you remember uh, Pastor Greg built me the coolest prop ever, right? Yeah, yeah, ever, right? Yes, yes. And the whole young youth group thought it was a guillotine. It is not. (laughs) They know Pastor Greg, so it made sense. In the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, uh, pretty early on, the Lord comes on what we call today Passover night, and God, who is above the highest of the high, looks at the entire country of Egypt, both the Jewish people who are in it, so those who follow the Lord, and the Gentile people, those who do not follow the Lord. He looks at all of them, and they, like us, are all below the lowest of the low. All sinners, all separated from him. And God says, I'm going to bring judgment on the entire country of Egypt. Now what God could have said in that moment was, everyone is going to die for their sin. What he says graciously is the firstborn male in every household firstborn son, will die this night. Then God comes to the people of Israel, to the Jewish people, and he gives them a gift. And the gift is a lamb. And he says to them, here's what you're going to do tonight. You take a male, perfect, blemishless lamb and sacrifice it. See, something had to die. The male lamb or the firstborn male in the household. And God said, if you take that lamb, you sacrifice it, it will die instead of the firstborn male in your household. But they weren't just to sacrifice the lamb, right? They were to take the blood and paint it on the doorframe of their house. And if you go back and you read the book of Exodus, you'll read that God says that that blood painted on the doorframe was a sign and it was a shelter. One, it was a sign that God really, really, really wants to save people who are below the lowest of the low. It was a sign that God gets to choose how to do it. Because my guess is the people of Israel could have come up with some wonderful other ways, like a nice ranking system. Save me because I'm good. It's also a sign that there has to be a sacrifice if God's going to save. There's got to be a substitute. But when they painted the blood on the door, it was a sign, right? God wants to save. But Scripture also calls it a shelter. God said to his people, Kill the lamb, paint it on your doorframe, and then take shelter behind it. Hide behind the blood of the lamb. So that when the angel of death comes through, the angel of death doesn't see you. The angel of death sees the blood of the lamb. And when the angel sees the blood and you're hidden behind it, you will be saved. That means that on that night, if any of the people in Israel had gone on the other side of that door, stood out front and said, I'm here to debate what's about to happen or I'm going to prove my worth, or try to bribe the angel of death, they would have died. It was only by taking shelter behind the blood that they got to live. Now, uh, side note, but remember, everybody had to take shelter. The ones who thought they were good, and the ones who thought they were bad. The ones who had absolute confidence in God's power that day, they believed that God was going to save them through the blood, and the ones who were riddled with doubt. Whoever took shelter behind the blood, they lived that night. Now come back to beside the Jordan River. And John, who knows he's below the lowest of the low, sees Jesus coming towards him. And he looks at Jesus and he says, that's the lamb. He's the lamb of God who takes away all the sins, not just of his, but of the whole world. And we'll talk in a couple of weeks, but when John talks about the world, it's never good. It's not even neutral. Because the world is filled with people, sinners, who are below the lowest of the low. John the Baptist looks at Jesus and he says, this is why. And he goes on in the next couple of sentences, right after he talks to them, and he says, this is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I didn't know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was so he would be revealed. 
That's why John does what he does. John, with incredible humility, uses his platform to prepare the way. Because he knows as he comes up to people, whatever their valley, whatever their mountain, he's there too. But he never is going to stop. John speaks with such insane urgency. He goes to anybody, whether it is the, the person at the top of the socioeconomic status or the one that nobody cares about. He goes to everybody with urgency because we're all in the same boat, below the lowest of the low. But we're also both loved more than we can imagine by the Lamb who's come into this world to save. That's why John does what he does. Now, here's the thing. Our what is the same as John's. Our platform, wherever we are placed, wherever we've been put in this world, is the same as John the Baptist. It is to prepare the way. It's to look at people and love them enough to say, what, what can I do that would help, even if it's just one shovel full, to fill the valley or take down the mountain so that when Jesus Christ comes, you're ready to hear. You're ready to receive. And the reason why we do it is the same. Because we have this amazingly humble truth that we are below the lowest of the low. And yet, the Lamb of God comes to us. We're loved more than we could ever imagine. See, I'm pretty convinced that when you and I understand our why, then our what comes to life. I'm going to show you a video. Actually, it's, it's good. Pastor Frank's here. It's a video he gave me. Uh, it's a video from a, a guy named Michael Jr. He's a comedian, Christian comedian. Um, and I want you just a two-minute clip as he shows us and gives you a really cool visual about why when we understand our why, our what, takes shape. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let, me get a couple, let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. All right, all right. Um, now, what you give me the version is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. what I want you to catch. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what becomes more impactful because you're walking towards or in your purpose. Did you catch that? Listen, if you... Um been part of church for all of two minutes, then you know our what. Our what is to use every platform we have to invite people to know Jesus Christ, both those who don't and those who do. We use every opportunity we have, every conversation we have to sit down with people. If you're sitting with a brother or sister in Christ and you're paying them any attention, you'll see the valley and you'll see the mountain. And you'll be able to look at your brother or sister, you'll be able to look at somebody that doesn't yet know Jesus and see, I can see what is separating you from being able to say yes to knowing the gospel of Jesus Christ more and more and more. But it is when we know our why. That's when things change. 
So you and I know more than John the Baptist did, friends. He looked at Jesus and he thought of a door frame, but you and I look at Jesus and we know that the door frame became a cross. We know what the Lamb of God did. That the Lamb of God, God himself, came to the lowest of the low. Came to us, the people more wicked than we can begin to dare, ask, think, or imagine. And because he loves us, he went to a cross. That's the hope of the gospel. And on that cross, not only did he take every bit of our sin, but he has called us to be a people who are transformed. A people who know we have a good God and we can trust him no matter what it is that we walk through. That's your why. And this changes everything, doesn't it? See, if I know these two truths, I know that I am below the lowest of the low, then when I come to a person who is unlovely, I can love the unlovely because so am I. And I am loved by the Lamb of God. When I understand uh, um, who I am, I'm not worried. I can't ask a thing of Jesus Christ on my own. Then when somebody sins against me, I can forgive that debt because I am way more forgiven than anything I'm being asked to forgive them of. When I know that who I am, my Savior came for me, then you know what? As many times as it takes, I will sit and have coffee with someone. As many times as it takes so that they know there is someone who sees them and loves them because I want them to know the Savior who sees them and loves them. The reason why John the Baptist is my hero is because people came to him and they said, why do you do what you do? And I want to live my love for Jesus Christ to such an extent that people are all the time coming and saying, Kelly, why do you do it? Why do you care? Why do you love this much? Why are you praying that hard? Why do you pursue that person? Why do you keep showing up in the places that people tell you not to be in? Why do you do it? Because I know I'm below the lowest of the low. And the Lamb of God loves me and loves them. That's why I will forever use my platform to prepare the way for him. And my prayer for us is that the community looks at this church and says, why do they do what they do? And we say, oh, because we know. And that people come to you in the spheres of influence that you get to go into, the classrooms you go into, the, the businesses you go into, the living rooms you go into that I'm never going to walk in. And they're always looking at you going, why do you do it? Why do you love like that? And you get to look back and say, because I'm lower than the lowest of the low. And the one who's above the highest of the high came for me. Here's your three questions. Friends, when you look at this passage of Scripture, who's Jesus? And what does it mean that he is the Lamb of God, the one above the highest of the high, and he chose to come for you? And who are you? You are both more wicked than you dare imagine and more loved. And if those things are true, then today, what is he asking you to do or to be? And how do you walk out the door, use your platform to prepare his way? As the band's coming forward, we're going to come before our God in prayer. If you need to come before Jesus today, and you need to confess, I know the what, Lord, but I don't have the why, then come and ask him today to show you that uh, you'd start to sing Amazing Grace like it's actually amazing. And as you're praying, invite the Lord to take your platform and use it to be the way, and prepare the way, for other people to know him. Let's go before him in prayer. Father, I pray that more and more 
We are a people who know our why. That we're a people who, who sing Amazing Grace because we know why we're singing it. We're people who look at the folks in front of us, we see the valley, we see the mountain, and whatever our platform may be, God, we're coming before you and saying, Lord, one shovel full at a time, how would you use me today? How would you cause me to live and to love in such a way that this person sees and experiences Jesus Christ? Lord, let us wrestle both with the reality that, that we're more wicked and more loved. God, may we forever be a people and a church where folks are always saying, Man, why do you love like this? As you get your gospel deeper and deeper into our hearts. Lord, I pray for all my brothers and sisters here, every platform that is represented, that Lord, as we step into our what, because we know our why, that God, your gospel would go forward, that revival will take place in this area, because we are a church that knows, knows and loves you. Jesus, we pray this in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand.